Good day, Great Hoffs. My name is Kaden Mazzukere, and I'm the author and publisher of the Distinction Bound Student Textbooks. And welcome to 1.6 Under Dynamics of Imperfect Markets. Now, this one would say study the graph below and answer the questions that follow. Uh, this is the long run, run equilibrium in a monopoly market. All right, how do we know it's long run? Well, we see economic profit here. And uh, what else do we see? Yeah. Then how do we also know it's monopoly? Uh, the demand curve is downward sloping. Well, this one doesn't look as inelastic as it should. Well, they didn't pay attention to that particular concept because this looks unitary elastic. If their demand curve was this one, the MR, and then the MR, they would have put it there. Well, basically, I think they didn't stick to that because that's not really the concept they were trying to assess here. But let's look at it the way we see it. Uh, we know it's monopoly because they told us it's monopoly. But uh, we would want to argue with the elasticity part. But let's leave that one out. Okay. So this is our demand curve, which is equal to AR as always. And they are not equal to MR because each additional unit is sold at a lower price. Then here is our average cost curve, which cuts the MC uh, at its lowest point. Okay, so this is the lowest point of the AC, and the MC cuts it there. And uh, based on our profit maximizing rule, this firm is going to produce um, 100 units because MC intersects MR at point C. Point A, B, D, E, they are just there to confuse you. Uh, they anticipate that question. Identify the profit maximizing output or point so if they say point, the answer is C. If they say output, the answer is 100. Then what is the market price? The market price is 6. How do we know? Because if 100 units are being produced, um, you see, and <laughs> other points that make sense in terms of profit maximization, it's B. Well, it doesn't because it doesn't intersect anything. Well, nothing else makes sense, to be honest. Okay, let's say it, they wanted D. 120 would be the output. What would be the price? They didn't give us the price. So why would they do that? It makes no sense. E. Let's say you think it's E. Okay. Maybe you'll say the price is 4 because they kind of correspond. But I don't see any dotted line there. Maybe it's hidden behind this. But clearly it's C because of the rule, first and foremost. So 100. And then we have a couple of quantities coming from that output. They made it a bit too obvious. They made it a bit too obvious. Okay, so the price is six rand. How do we know? We know that because at 100 units, it uh, touches demand curve at A, and then that's the price. Then the other part, uh, AC, the cost on average at 100 units is four rand per unit. So this firm is making an economic profit uh, of two rand per unit, two times 100, that's uh, 200. Okay, so now let's go to the questions. Indicate the profit maximizing point. That's point C. We said so. How many units will be produced at the profit maximizing point? That's a stupid question because it's the same as this one asked us. Because from C, it's 100. You can't get it wrong. Like it's illegal. You cannot. Then, number three, <clears throat> determine whether the business is making an economic profit or an economic loss. Uh, show calculations. Okay, we said AR, 6 minus AC, 4, which is equal to 2, then 2 times 100, which is equal to 200. So therefore, the firm is making an economic profit. Last one, what favorable conditions may the monopolist enjoy? Uh, well, this one is not is not on the, on, the, on the diagram that we have, the graph that we just analyzed. But uh, what favorable conditions do monopolies enjoy? Well, a lot. One of them is that they are protected by barriers of entry. Yes, those barriers can either be natural or artificial. So uh, we, when barriers are natural, we call that particular monopoly a natural monopoly. When they are artificial, we call it an artificial monopoly. Artificial barriers are things like uh, patents. Yes. And uh, natural barriers are 
things like, well, others may want to participate, but it's ridiculously expensive that they cannot. So naturally, so without anyone saying, no, you cannot enter, you won't enter because, yeah, that's a, an example of something natural. Well, another, but, but the point you make there is uh, barriers to entry protect them from gaining competition. Another one would be uh, they are price makers. That's a favorable condition. They make up the price. Another one is they may restrict output and charge a high price. Well, perfect competitors cannot do that because their demand curves are horizontal. They are perfectly elastic. It's impossible. Another condition that they may enjoy is that um, they don't necessarily have to collude with anyone. Uh, another one is maybe, well, I've given four. That's eight marks, but this is four marks. So I, I, I would have already gotten my total four in an exam. But let's look at the answers. Indicate the profit maximizing point. That's point C. Uh, 100 units. Yes, that was the stupid one. Uh, then number three, it's fine if you give this alone or give this alone, but I feel like this is the same thing because once you know it's C, then it's 100. Maybe they should have asked at least price, at least because, yeah, price would kind of confuse if we look at it. Look, upon thinking, profit maximizing point is C. From C, many people would think. Three rand is the price. Yes, this would have been a better question than from here, straight down, 100. There is no confusion. But this concept would be something else because it's actually not there. It's there. So it would trick a learner to say, okay, if this is the profit maximizing point, then the price should be three. So many learners do that. And I ask them to do it intentionally. Whenever I ask them to go to the board, they'll get this one right, the quantity. I ask the next learner to come and show us the price. They'll nine times out of 10, if not 9.9 .9 times out of 10, they come and say, this is the price. And I ask another learner if it's wrong, if it's correct. They all say it's correct. Then I'm like, no, price is determined by demand. See, so honestly speaking, I think they would have done it like that. Okay. Other conditions that must prevail, oh, fine, sorry. The the other one for profit, we say 200, which is economic profit. Then the last one, favorable conditions. The monopoly is the only supplier of the particular product. At liberty to set own price, uh, decides, which means they are price taker, makers, then decides on production levels, and restrict its output, I said it. Uh, laws protection, protected by barriers to entry. I said this one, uh, favorable ge geographical area, then does not produce at the lowest possible cost. Now, this is the reason why they are not productively efficient. Then the monopoly is, oh, but, but uh, how is this a favorable condition? Well, because it benefits the monopoly itself, not the consumers. This is a bad thing to us as consumers but for the monopoly it's a good thing for them that they don't have to produce at the lowest possible cost but perfectly competitive firms are forced like they may not want to but so that is a good thing for consumers but not for the business itself the next one the monopoly is least efficient at allocating resources look so this shows they are productively inefficient. This shows that they are allocatively inefficient. And perfect competition is the most efficient. I always say this. Well, accept any other relevant responses. Well, this has brought us to the end of this particular video. And uh, thank you so much. God bless.